Chapter 45, The Unwanted. It's Saigon, January 2nd, 1985. With the money we got from selling Luan's necklace, my mother took us to Saigon one week prior to our appointment with the American interviewers. We took refuge at the home of the late Mrs. Duong's parents. The older couple lived within walking distance of the infamous Dakla Palace in a small shack that once had been their kitchen. The big house next door where we had met with Mrs. Duong 10 years ago on our way to the helicopter had been subdivided several times and sold to different people. The kitchen and the tiny bathroom were all that they had left. The cabin was extremely small, even for two elderly people. Nevertheless, Mr. and Mrs. Holm welcomed us with open arms. Saigon had changed a great deal since the end of the Civil War. Like most of its disgruntled, tired citizens, the city showed signs of a difficult course of living. Once fine houses were crumbling, gnawed by termites. Paint had peeled from the walls and been replaced with moss. Through the holes that had previously held windows, dirty faces of children peeked out at passers-by with blank looks. Bicycles and rickshaws filled the narrow streets contributing to a constant and deafening noise. In fact, the loud cacophony was difficult for us to get used to in this ever-zealous hive of activity. I walked numbly through the unfamiliar streets, preoccupied with the complicated departure procedures. I was afraid to face my fears. I did not know where fate would lead my family and me. Our future was a mystery. Whether I was going to leave or stay was being determined by faceless strangers. I would never know. Saigon in 1985 was cramped, congested, and swamped with filth. In the blazing temperature, dirt particles floated in the air and trickled down onto everything like an endless stream of black snow. I quickly learned not to wear anything light in color outside. Things got dirty fast, especially around the center of Saigon, where everybody scrambled to get from one polluted place to the next. The letter that accompanied our passports gave the address of the immigration office as 4 Zui Tan Boulevard, a street well known for its tall, healthy, and lustrous tamarind trees. These were familiar tropical fruit trees with branches that had whorls of fish scale leaves and jointed stems entwining together to roof the road like a canopy. Bakla Palace and the former U.S. Embassy were just a few blocks away, hidden behind those green curtains of leaves. At 6.30 in the morning, my family and I gathered outside the immigration office's gate with 20 other Amerasian children and their families. All were waiting for a bus that would take us to the interview site an hour away. At that time, the embargo between the U.S. and Vietnam was strictly enforced. In order for the American Council of Voluntary Agencies to work in Vietnam, its staff had to fly in from Bangkok every morning to a secluded town outside of Saigon and leave before night fell. We came by bus to meet with the representatives during those designated hours. Their place of work was located inside a mansion that had probably belonged to a rich entrepreneur in the past. Remnants of the former owner's expensive taste were still visible. The house sat on one side of a hill overlooking a forest of rubber trees. Two enormous wings joined together with a much bigger central house in a U-shape, embracing a wide red marble veranda. Large rooms with oversized glass windows on the second and third floors had been turned into offices. Through the sheer glass, I could see foreign people moving back and forth with folders and pens in their hands. Any of them could have been the one who typed the first correspondence to me, and they now would determine my fate. From a short distance, their faces looked so beautiful, so bright, and yet so alien. How I wanted to be one of them. And for the first time in many years, I was not ashamed of my American features. Watching them made me realize where I came from 
and where I should belong. Their presence stirred up in me a surge of anxiety. As if reading my thoughts, my mother pulled at my arm. Look, Kian, she said, pointing at the Americans. Do you know what that means? The eagle has come for her young. Waiting for our names to be called, we gathered around a large rectangular table on one side of the veranda. Each of us was dressed in the nicest outfit that he or she could afford according to the latest fashion of the city, blue jeans and silk blouses or striped shirts. Most of the Amerasian children in my group ranged in age from 12 to 19. They stared at one another, straining to conceal their curiosity with a mask of polite indifference. Standing apart from the group, was a family of 16, clad in beautiful clothing and expensive jewelry, like a shining flock of peacocks. They huddled under a Kazirian tree, eating green bean cakes from a picnic basket. A young girl of about 14, with straight blonde hair and blue eyes, stood shyly among them. In her hands, she held a big pitcher of iced tea made from condensed milk and black tea. The oldest woman in the group, who was so fat that she seemed to swallow the chair beneath her, called out for the girl in a clear, exultant voice. Give me something to drink, my petite daughter. She repeated the phrase over and over again, laughing, as if at some private joke. A thick coat of powder cracked at the corner of her eyes. Her family recoiled each time she called the girl her daughter. They grunted with disgust, hiding their discomfort in their overly enthusiastic conversations. When my family's name was called, we ran to meet our interviewer at the foot of a staircase. She was a black woman dressed in a dark blue business suit, as beautiful and alien as a colored porcelain doll. Her perfume hung in the air like the smell of a black rose in my uncle's garden after the rain. A Vietnamese translator stayed a few steps behind her. After a simple greeting and handshakes, they took us upstairs. As soon as she opened the door to her office and invited us in, a blast of cold wind from the air conditioner swallowed me in its gentle westernized embrace. I took in a deep breath and suddenly America was inside my lungs. Next to me, my mother began to cry. Soon after the interview, we left Saigon in a hurry. There was no chance for us to enjoy the view. The city was so expensive that we could not afford to stay too long. Besides, the place of Mr. and Mrs. Home was too small to accommodate a large family such as mine. My mother assigned Jimmy to stay behind at Mr. and Mrs. Home's place to monitor the airplane schedule and the list of departing refugees, which was posted every week at the immigration office. After we returned to Nha Trang, we communicated with him mainly through telegrams. My duty was to take care of the paperwork. According to the Vietnamese government, before anyone could leave the country, three essential documents were required. A signature from the Department of Real Estate, a debt-free statement from the Central Bank of Vietnam, and a certification from the Department of Taxation. The purpose was to prove to the government that those departing owed and owned nothing. For us, time was running out. Rumors about my family's meeting with the American interviewers arrived in Nha Trang before we did. Greeting us in front of our door was a line of Amerasians. Most of these children were homeless. Their filthy clothes were torn, their skin was dull, and their faces had no traces of baby fat. They looked at us, their eyes sparkling with hope. Many of the children had brought along the application they had picked up at the local immigration center. I walked in side by side with my mother and Betty reached for the latch of the front gate. Two black girls, the first in line, grinned at me. One of them said shyly, Mr. Kian, would you please help my sister and me? We need to fill out these papers, but we can't read or write. Her sister added, we saved up some money to pay for your services. She opened her hand to show me a wrinkled 20 dong note. She must have held on to it so long and so tightly that the bill was nearly decomposed from the perspiration of her palm. Carefully, she laid it in my hand. 
Both girls were about the same age, 13 or 14. Their hairstyles were enormous, like two thick pine topiaries. I pushed the money back to her. Keep it, I told them. I can't take your money, but don't worry. I will help you fill out those forms. My mother spoke up. Where do I know you girls? Was it from the noodle shop at Lachan Street? Yes, madam, they said simultaneously. Dear heaven, all those years you are still on the street? She asked, where is your mother? One of the girls answered, she died last year. The doctor said it was from syphilis. We have been on our own since. I took the applications from their hands. Curiosity overtook me and I asked them, how did you know that we were coming today? The same innocent smile brightened their faces. We heard about your lucky news at the market on Monday. And since then, we have been waiting here for the past three days. That day, I filled out more than 20 applications. The next day, more children arrived, bringing with them more papers. Not until then did I realize the shocking number of abandoned Amerasians in my city. Each morning, I woke up to see at least 10 faces peering from behind the barbed wire that encircled my front lawn. All wore the same frightened, uncertain, yet trusting expression. They all wanted to touch me, to feel the significant reality of the Americans I had come in contact with. For most of these children, what happened to my family was the dream they aspired to live someday themselves.